hopefully you can see it with that camera. Now all I did was put a, um, I would say it's three quarters of an inch square piece of rosewood. It looks like coca bolo. And um, I just grabbed it with a chuck. And I'm going to take it down even smaller uh, with the bull gouge. So you could do this with a skew chisel too if you want to. I can reach under the rest and around with my finger to stabilize it. It's going to get mighty small. These are tiny little bird houses, so the perch isn't very big at all. Chunk just came out of my wood. Probably should have the lathe running faster because it's so tiny, but the next couple steps don't require that much speed. I can feel a chunk of wood missing here. Well, I'm gonna have to cut it off. Get back to some good wood. about as hard as it gets. I'm going to do the very end of the perch away from the birdhouse ornament. Just round it a little bit. And you can use a skew chisel or a tiny little gouge. I'm going to cut now toward the uh, headstock. And just skinny it up. If I had to describe the shape to you, I'd say it's about like a golf tee. But much, much smaller. And I'm guessing that the hole I would drill to put it in would be roughly an eighth of an inch. Can you guys see that? Really hard to see, isn't it? Tell you what, I'm going to take it off the lane for a second and hold it up to the camera. And uh, maybe you get an idea how little it is. Okay, coming at you here, Archie. That's it. Can you see that? So it's ready to cut off, and I'll hand it around to everybody to look at when we're done. But if you start off with a pretty long stick and a gentle touch, you can do 10 or 20 of these and throw them in a jar. And uh, it comes shiny right off the tool. The rosewood's so hard, so you really have no sanding involved. And a real thin parting tool, you can just uh, part it off and catch it. There it is. Not hard, right? It could be maple, it could be rosewood, it could be ebony, it could be apple, it could be... I like contrasting colors, so if the birdhouse ornament is white, I might choose a dark wood perch, so it shows up better. But you can also do it without a chuck if you don't own one. Just put a scrap block on a faceplate, um, put your piece of wood for your perch between centers, turn it into a dowel, and glue it into the hole in the faceplate wood. And that way it's sticking out and it's well held by glue. Um, so you don't have to have a chuck. So that would be the perch. And now we'll do the bottom. Or the bowl part of the ornament. So again, I made this tenon to fit my blank. Which is right here. So there's a hole in the blank. And all I do is I start whittling on the tenon and keep trying it on. I just drill the hole in a piece of scrap. That's it, with a Forstner bit. And I use the um, uh, drill press. I just set it on there and brought it down and drilled the hole. You don't have to use a drill press. Use a Forstner bit, it'll be fine. And, uh, it's a big Forstner bit. I think it's the three. Don't want to use I think it's a three-quarter inch if you, if you really want to know the size. 
And this is also a blank. I'll try to get this up by the camera. That's another one. This piece of mahogany. And it's square on top. It was left over from another job. But it would make a bottom. And it would shove on the same thing. Same drill bit was used. So whatever you want to stick on there. This is a piece of uh, hard maple from uh, a Lanson I got from uh, the Pressy family. Uh, they built that hotel in Alance in that real pretty that one there. Long time, ago. long time ago. I had a big log. I wanted to buy it from Mike and he wouldn't sell it to me until it rotted out in the yard. Then he sold it to me. Um, you can bring the tailstock up just so when you're first roughing out till you get the thing around, it's a little margin of safety. And I'm going to use the bull gouge again just to get the square corners off. And obviously, if you're cutting toward the headstock, you're pushing it on. Cutting the other way, you're pulling it off. This is hard maple. Very hard maple. Had a lot of nice curl in it, too, that log. was actually kind of oversized for the size of the hole, uh, so I have quite a bit of wood to take off. Unless I want a bigger one. What do you think? When do you stop? When you want to. So I could turn a little beehive looking thing. I could turn a round ball like an acorn. I could turn any shape that I want, but I have to be aware how far my hole is comes into that so I don't cut through it on the bottom. But I believe I'm round now. It's got some really nice curl in it, that piece of wood. And if you're not sure about your wall thickness, you can stop, you can pull it off and have a look and see where you're at. That's still got a good 3 eighths of an inch wall thickness, so I can go a lot, lots thinner than that. Questions so far, anybody? No? Observations. I just took off another eight, so now I'm down to about a quarter. Another eight. Probably three sixteenths or thereabouts. You can stop and take a look. I'd say I'm a quarter inch thick. I'm going to take down about half of that. We'll call it good. And now that you have that uh, pretty well down, I just, I just check the wood and make sure I don't have a ton of torn grain that I might want to have one more go at it with a freshly sharpened tool then have a little bit less torn grain or sanding. It's a very light pass. That's a good example of what I call torch versus finesse. There is a time in wood turning where force is a necessary attribute. But when you get down to turning many and stuff like this, finesse is the name of the game. And finesse is a lot more hard to teach than force. Agree wholeheartedly. So I have a pretty good surface there. I think I'm, I'm going to hit it really quickly. I'm going to start at 220 and just see if it cleans up. If it doesn't, I drop back to 120. I got a little bit of torn. It's so curly that it's kind of unavoidable to have a little bit of torn fibers. Just want to see how it's going to look here. Yeah, I got to drop back. So I think I have a 120 here. Yep. Okay. 
And then I'm going to do the bottom of the pole uh, next. Get this sanded out. If you uh, exert a lot of force on these, the heat of sanding will sometimes expand the wood and it'll come loose on the jam. So you want to just light pressure when you're sanding. Oh, that's 120, 220. Feels really silky smooth now. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the bottom. And I think that hole is in there about three quarters of an inch deep. And I also want to have a square top. So I'm going to reach in here by the chuck and just push straight in with a parting tool. Right there. And then I probably can dial it in tight. And now I can start whittling down the bottom, whatever shape. Probably just going to turn an elongated uh, shape here with a little bit of a finial. Now if I cut toward the tailstock, I'm intending to pull it off the jam, but if I use a light touch, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. I have the tailstock there for now. My tool rest is way further away from my work than I would like, but it's kind of tight in here, so yeah. there we go. But this was um, well, isn't that interesting? So what I did is I have a deeper hole than I thought, and I cut through the bottom. So. That's how to ruin a demo, right? So what did we just produce now? Napkin ring. <laughs> I don't know if I have, I have another one here. Let's see. That one. Mahogany one. Yeah, let's try this one. Little, little loose too. Any idea what to do about that? Masking tape. Tape. Little tape, little sandpaper, little glue. We got a bunch of options there. Uh, I thought I had more than one. Here's one. Maybe it'll be a tighter. Nope, worse. Okay, let's try a little bit of sandpaper here. There we go. Well, the trick is not to cut through the bottom, right? So that hole was a little deeper than I thought into that blank. You could mark it on the outside of the blank so you know. If I was more organized, I probably would have. What's that? I say you could prove you're actually human. Watch your fruit. Hours and hours turning, you've never made a mistake. Thanks. All right. I'm just going to whittle down the bottom a little bit sure here. And again. It's your design, that's the nice part about miniatures, they, the design comes quickly and uh, very fluid, you can change it. I try to never make two alike, I always try to make them just, just a little bit different from one another. And you can um, embellish with a piece of wire, uh, burn a line. Nice little black line. And now I'm going to take away this tail stock. Hopefully it'll stay put. And reach over here and just cut it off. And 
and then I'm going to sharpen that just a little bit more here. And you can reach around and kind of hold it on the jam. There we go. And 220. Feels like I still have a square spot on the I mean, right there, a little bitty spot. Yeah. Choose wisely here. Okay. See how he, he got his eye. But he's feeling that with his fingers. His fingers tell him more than his eyes. They tell me a lot more than my eyes do at my age, too. I, I could feel imperfections I can't see. Hey. And when you really get in the mood to do this kind of work, you can really go quick on these and, I mean, just one right after another and make a pile of them and, you know, do all the bottoms, throw them in a little cup. And then you can mix and match colors and styles. And, you know, it becomes very creative. So that was... Um, 220, 320. Here's some 400. Hey, sorry, Google told me to one that. Founders of artistic wood turning, for lack of a better term, in the country. He, that he didn't, he didn't break. He just did. So this is the friction polish. Those are my lines for one third, one third, one third. Denatured alcohol linseed oil and shellac. Mix it good, a few drops onto the tissue or the, uh, you can have it with the lathe running or off. I like to shut it off and just give it a quick coat with it off and then turn it on. I don't get dry spots that way because sometimes it cures so quickly it gels over. Yeah, you can get a wax and build up. Like yeah. And then look at how it's already dried on the rag right there. And just You can apply several coats. You could take 4 out steel wool and dull it between coats. It'll make the next coat stick a little better. It'll smooth out the any dust bunnies you might have trapped in it. But Obviously, I've only had one Christmas to make coats. Yeah, there you go. But I, uh, I wasn't even going through the process. I was literally... When you got to that point right there, I just rubbed a little oldie on it and grabbed the sawdust and just gave her a quick squeeze, a high spin, and took it off. So you done. also can... Uh, I, I knew there was no one going to be handling You could use like CA that. on this, or you could line them all up when just, they're done and spray them with yeah. lacquer. I mean, you don't know, really... What you're doing right there, but just grab the sawdust and just hold it, and there's a polish. You so know, you can see it's it's not as shiny as it could be, but it's it's pretty nice. And uh, so now this one's done, and you just pull it off. I like the little more stuff less shiny. I like the little more stuff to show green. And so that's about an eighth inch, maybe a little more wall thickness. And that's the finished part. Okay. So that's pretty quick. And especially if you're doing a bunch of them, have them all pre-drilled. You know how deep your holes are pretty quick and as I mentioned earlier you could have had something like this in a chuck and turned that down and fitted it on there too you don't have to have a dedicated um, stuff like that and then the next step we're going to do is turning the top so this is a Morris taper good idea to have clean tapers uh, who knows how clean this one is but they do make a nice little plastic thing to shove in there to clean your tapers. I think that's a really good idea. I've never sprung for one, but what are they, about 20 bucks? Green plastic. Yeah, I know. I don't, I don't have any. But I know that the companies that make these lays take good pains to make sure that bore is precision machined, and so are, are the things you put in it. And that's what makes them stick. And if they've got crud in there, they don't stick too well. And some of the kids here at school, I notice they'll jam them in there and turn the lathe on. They'll be squealing away and falling off. And, you know, you, you also, uh, some of these are fitted so that in the back side of that, it has uh, threads. And you can put a piece of thread all in there and have nut out here so they can't come out. Because sometimes when they try to rattle, they will come out. 
So you also get to tap them a little bit, helps heat that taper. And again, when you first start, you can bring up the tailstock, just make sure, because everything is square here, that we're in good shape. Okay, so I'm starting with everything square. Uh, purple heart, or rosewood is the bottom one that I'm cutting right now. Should hear the noise change when it gets to be round. Just about there. Nice and quiet, so that tells me the first one is probably, see a tiny flat right there, but it's just about round. And this is a great time to use short tools. So if you have like gouges that are ground down to where there's hardly any flute left, it's a perfect thing. You're not hanging way over the rest. You don't need the leverage. Use them up. Now I'm going to start a cut pulling toward the headstock. More of a pulling cut going down. Shut off the lathe and get a look at it. So I have uh, East Indian Rosewood, Purple Heart, Cherry, Purple Heart, Cherry, Purple Heart. Um, all again, just epoxied, set one on top of the other. Getting pretty nice. When you're working with that laminate sex long, mm -hmm. whether it's CA glue or epoxy or whatever, you have to be careful with heat. Because that heat, there's not much surface there, glue surface there. And if you introduce heat, you're going to delaminate the, the epoxy. Just, just go slow, light touch. You're not, you know, I'm hogging pretty good considering how small it is, but you can really take your time and go easy and slow. I'm going to whittle down the part that has the uh, tail stock now. Use a little tiny pouch here. Get back in there if I can. And this will be um, like a little tiny uh, knob on. I believe most of the layers are cross grain this way. So I'm cutting downhill on the grain coming toward myself, a pulling cut. Uh, there are some of my examples in the other room are end grain tops. So I'd be cutting in the other direction. Be cutting downhill uh, to smaller diameter. And right up here on the very top, I usually drill that hole for the uh, per, for the uh, hanger with a tiny little drill bit. While it's spinning here, I try to drill it. So I leave myself a, a little flat. I just knocked it right off. Not a very good demo today. So that was glued on there. I'm going to abort, and I'll make a new knob out of this cherry that's on the top. Again, every mishap, as Frank Sedol told me, is a future design opportunity. He always used to save his blown up pieces in a pile and, and he'd say, well, I can make something else out of that. So, First thing he'd say, some bitch. Yeah, he always said that too. <laughs> some bitch. <laughs> I like old Frank. I never liked that design anyway. Now what I'm doing is I'm underneath the eaves of the roof and I'm kind of rounding them underneath a little bit. So it's a pulling cut toward me. Just sort of an upswept look. And then a parting tool, put it in underneath here. That one's kind of wide. I'll try this one. And I'm trying to make just that tenon that glues into the Pull. So I use a real small one and I'm going to do multiple passes. And I have a little scrap block on the screw 
that tells me the size because the hole was drilled. So when I match that, I just stop. I believe I'm there. Just a little big. But I had to put sandpaper inside my bottom part, so. That's it. So now I have a tiny little tenon on the bottom and I got it all roughed out and we could bore a hole there for the uh, the hanger. And I didn't mention how to make those. Um, you got a couple of choices. Um, that's brass wire and copper wire. You can buy it at hobby shops. And I'll do one in the copper because it'll be easier for you to see. But the brass is very tiny. And all I do to make the perch is just take a round object and bend, bend the wire around the round object into sort of a shepherd's hook look. That's oversized for what I want. This is bigger than it needs to be, but it just illustrates what the part looks like here. So it sort of looks like a question mark. You can see that? Pretty easy to make. There. And then if you had a little drill bit here, you drill into that and just see a glue that little hook into it. And I would use the finer brass wire instead of the copper. Uh, just plenty strong to hold that little ornament. But that's how I make the hooks. And the perches I already showed you, you just drill a hole in here for the bird entry hole and tiny hole for the perch. And we'll put a little finish on this, sand it, and that's it. Questions, comments. You got geared up for this, you could do them pretty quick, couldn't you? Because they just screw on or they push on and they pull off. And so you could have literally a shoebox and just turn all tops one day and all bottoms the next day, all perches, and, and then just mix and match colors, styles, whatever you want to do. about it. If you have a drill press, you can take all your tops and set them on the drill press table and come down with a tiny little bit and bore for the hanger too. You don't have to do it up while in the lathe while it's spinning. Uh, you do get it perfectly centered on the lathe, but most Jacob's chucks won't grab a bit that small they, unless you have a really nice one. Okay, a little bit of juice here and we'll put them together. I like the soy sauce bottle because it's got the dropper on top. I use a plastic, I use a plastic bottle with a sprayer. Squeeze bottle or a sprayer. Yeah, those work great. I just have gotten used to the soy sauce bottle. I really like them. Now this is much harder wood than the mahogany. So this stuff is really coming up shiny. Um, looks really pretty. It's got all really nice colors too. So you unscrew it off the chuck. The other thing you can do if your hole in your bottom is a little too snug, you can put a drum sander in your drill press and just go like that. Just enlarge it a few thousandths and it'll go. It's, it's still a little tight for that hole, so I can put it back on and take it down just a little more. Well, just about everything has gone wrong with this demo that possibly could, so a little trim here is not the end of the world.
Still a little bit snug. How many times can you do this, do you think? Until it's too loose. Until it's too loose. Good reply. <laughs> Once you're dialed in and you've got the right little diameter established on your screw chuck, there we go. Not a bad little ornament, huh? Turn it sideways. There you go. Oh, it's backwards. There we go. I'll pass it around. Very nice. So not hard to make. <laughs>